This podcast series is dedicated to all impacted, especially those who have lost their lives due to the health effects caused by PFAS exposure and pollution. If I start with what is PFAS? PFAS is a very big group of fluororganic chemicals and polymers. They have what we call extraordinary properties. PFAS are industrial chemicals, and the carbon fluorine bond is perhaps the strongest in the periodic table. It takes the energy of lightning to break it. PFAS are known as forever chemicals. The chemical industry knew that PFAS could be harmful. So it's used in places that folks don't think in every pizza box that you've gotten a pizza in. It's in your coffee cup at your favorite coffee joint around the corner. It's in cosmetics. You know, it's it's everywhere. PFAS chemicals are wreaking havoc on our health and environment. It's a really serious issue. So there's health impacts and there are environmental impacts. So many of them have been found to last essentially on geologic time. Difficult to remove, difficult to filter, and then once removed and filtered, difficult uh, to dispose of. They have been found to bioaccumulate in uh, people and animals and have been found in almost every living creature on Earth. We need to eliminate our apparent appetite for using PFAS. The environmental impacts are pretty potent. Many of us refer to these as forever chemicals. To understand the current PFAS problem, we must first understand how we got here. Over the course of 10 episodes, we will explore the larger issues surrounding PFAS as a class of chemicals, the role the outdoor industry plays in the discussion, and how we can best move forward in collaboration with one another. So let's begin by identifying what PFAS are. PFAS are industrial chemicals that consist of a chain of carbon surrounded by fluorine atoms. And the carbon-fluorine bond is perhaps the strongest in the periodic table. It takes the energy of lightning to break it. And PFAS are forever. Once you have a PFAS, it never breaks down in the environment. And sadly enough, all the ones that have been well studied have been found to be toxic in one of a variety of ways. So a chemical that's toxic and never breaks down is a big worry. I'm Arlene Bloom. I'm the executive director of the Green Science Policy Institute. And I started working with PFAS, interestingly enough, trekking in Nepal with a Swedish PFAS scientist, reading a book called Stain Repellent, Waterproof, and Lethal. That was in 2013. And I was pretty horrified at what I read. And since that was her expertise, everything I read, she would go, and it's worse than that. So I came back and I Googled, in those days they were called PFCs, not PFAS, and there was really nothing except some local news in a community in West Virginia that was highly contaminated. Some of the only people who cared about PFAS or knew about it were scientists. So I started a scientist call, which we've had once a month since 2013. And I was really astonished. I got a list of kind of the leading PFAS scientists and wrote them. And they all agreed to be on a call because all the scientists were super worried. They felt isolated. They felt like nobody was paying any attention. And so we started 10 years ago having monthly calls, which have been incredibly useful in getting the word out about PFAS. Due to the proven health and environmental hazards these chemicals pose, PFAS have been the subject of high-profile lawsuits against chemical manufacturers such as 3M and DuPont, bringing attention to one of the most controversial chemicals of this century. We've effectively created a chemical we don't know how to destroy, but where did it even come from? The first form of this chemical, polychlorotrifluoroethylene, or PCTFE, was discovered by two German chemists, Fritz Schlaufer and Otto Schreier, in 1934, but it wasn't commercialized until the 1950s. The PCTFE, developed in the 1930s, became the precursor for what is now known as Teflon, or polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE. Teflon was made popular by DuPont, now Comores, for nonstick pans and cookware, but grew in consumer application for waterproof membranes, cosmetics, nail polish, and much more. What's surprising about the development of Teflon is that it was a complete accident. In the 1986 paper, The History of Polytetrafluoroethylene, Discovery and Development, the inventor of Teflon, Roy J. Plunkett, 
wrote that he was assigned by DuPont to develop a new alternative to fluorocarbon-based refrigerants. While working on this assignment in 1938, Plunkett and Jack Reebok discovered that when frozen and compressed, these chemicals formed a white waxy solid, creating PTFE or Teflon. DuPont's first application of Teflon was as a component in the Manhattan Project to build the atomic bomb in World War II. More specifically, the chemical was used for gaskets and valves to hold the toxic uranium hexafluoride in pipes at the project's uranium plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. After the war, DuPont wanted to explore the new polymer and its applications. It was obvious that Teflon was highly durable, heat-resistant, and could withstand strenuous environments, as noted by Plunkett in his 1986 paper. Although it was first discovered in 1938, it wasn't until 1945 that DuPont trademarked PTFE as Teflon. Within the same year, 3M, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, began to upscale the production of floral chemicals and other types of PFAS, fast-tracking the spread of their application in consumer products. A few years later, in 1951, DuPont began manufacturing Teflon in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Then 3M scientists discovered perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, or PFOS, another type of PFOS. And like Teflon, these were discovered by accident. After spilling the chemicals on their canvas shoes, the scientists discovered that they had stain-resisting properties. Ooh. This was then used as a component in a variety of 3M products, including Scotchgard. For decades, they were primarily manufactured by companies like 3M and DuPont, now Comores, as well as other companies like Salve and Daikin, among others. These are chemicals that are typically added to products to make them stain or water resistant. They have other uses as well. Those are two of the primary functions for the use of PFAS. Interestingly, the chemical industry, companies like 3M, knew that PFAS could be harmful to not only workers, but the public. Instead of sharing that information with the federal government or with workers, companies like 3M kept that information to themselves. And over the years, the more that scientists study PFAS, we learn that exposure to PFAS has been linked to a wide array of really serious health problems. My name is Mike Shade. I direct the Mind the Score program for Toxic Free Future. Toxic Free Future is a national environmental health research and advocacy organization that works to protect the public from exposure to dangerous chemicals like PFAS. We're headquartered in Seattle, Washington. We've been around for about 40 years. We work at the state level and at the federal level to advance policies to safeguard U.S. residents from exposure to dangerous chemicals like PFAS. The first recorded incident, perhaps foreshadowing the dangers of these chemicals, occurred in 1944, when three DuPont scientists were exposed to PFAS chemicals, ultimately leading to their deaths. The tragedy was closely followed by the death of two other scientists from DuPont, who died due to an explosion. Despite these early signs of the hazards, fluorocarbons began to enter mainstream use, with primary selling points being convenience. I've got great news for you, and it's right under this macaroni and cheese. Now, glass ovenware comes with a Teflon finish. So now glass is not the cleanup problem it used to be. For no stick baking and easy cleanup, look for the Teflon 2 quality seal from Bond. Teflon 2. Even publications like Popular Mechanics wrote about fluorocarbons in a way that bought into their user functions. And in a 1954 article, they wrote, quote, Consider, for example, the possibility of a lifetime lubricant sealed into your car engine, a house paint that just plain refuses to permit your house to burn down, pots and pans that literally push away scorched foods, detergents so effective a grease monkey's overalls will come clean in a few swishes, unquote. I'm a polymer chemist since 40 years back and I've uh, been working with quite a lot of hazardous chemicals and also Probably the most challenging ones, PFAS, a very big group of chemicals since the mid-90s. I'm involved and have been involved for decades in regulatory work in the European Union and also on a global scale in the Stockholm and Rotterdam Convention to face off these hazardous, very unpleasant chemicals. Already in 1954, 
toxicologists at DuPont knew they were toxic. In 1961, 3M toxicologists concluded that PFAS could bind to proteins. So they have, they have known for 60 years that these chemicals are toxic and they should be very handled with care. Somehow, this knowledge was diminished somehow. Uh, so awareness, if you mean public awareness, it has it maybe the last 20 years, but it has been a well-known secret for the industry for 60 years. In just two decades, a laboratory accident turned into a discovery of class of chemicals used in the atomic bomb to chemistry found in common household items. The science didn't stop there, though. In 1967, a fire aboard a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, the USS Forrestal, killed more than 130 people. The fire started due to the accidental launch of a rocket into armed planes and loaded fuel tanks. After this tragedy, the development of these chemicals focused on manufacturing aqueous film-forming foam, or AFFF, a foam mixture that extinguishes fire. AFFF contains PFOS, which makes it highly effective against petroleum and other flammable liquid fires. And the effectiveness of these firefighting foams led to their use on military and civilian ships, in firefighting, and on airplanes and at airports. Hi, I'm Scott Wilson. I'm president and CEO of Regenesis. And Regenesis is a technology innovation firm that's been active for over 25 years now. And what we do is we focus on developing technologies to restore the environment, much like a physician reaches for a pharmaceutical company or a medical device company for the tools to restore the body. What we do is we've developed technologies that engineering companies around the world reach for when they need to restore the environment. If there's a fire and you spray this foam on the surface of liquids, water, airplanes, whatever, it will snuff out the fire right away. They're highly effective. These foams are highly effective at stopping fires. Thus, they've been embraced for firefighting foams. They're also known as AFFF, which stands for aqueous film-forming foams. And they were marketed by several companies, manufactured and marketed by several companies for firefighting foams. They're actually the top mill spec. In other words, military really appreciates these foams to put out fires in critical areas like naval ships, aircraft carriers, hangars, these sorts of things. They're widely used on airports throughout the world. And one of the ways they get into the environment is by training at airports and uh, actually just even residential firefighters. They very often have training areas where they dig a pit and fill it full of a flammable liquid like diesel fuel, light it, and then put it out with these foams at practice. And that's one of the ways that these chemicals get into the atmosphere and into the environment. Although the applications span far and wide outside the outdoor industry, one question I had to explore was how PFOS entered the world of outdoor recreation. During the development of Teflon, applications to fabric and textiles were included as early as 1946. Ten years later, 3M Scotchgard was introduced as a stain and soil repellent for wool, and the application within the world of textiles grew from there and expanded into fabrics well known in the outdoor industry for their waterproof capabilities. One of the early adopters of PFOS chemistry and textiles was the founder of W.L. Gore & Associates. According to their website, W.L. Gore & Associates was founded by Bill and Vive Gore in 1958, after Bill left his job at DuPont. Bill saw the, quote, untapped potential of PTFE and worked over the next decade to create new innovations, such as the EPTFE Gore-Tex liner. Gore's first product was a PTFE-coated flat cable used in things like underground water lines and within the world of the first supercomputers. Bill knew that there was more potential, so they kept pushing to find new applications for this chemistry. In 1969, Bill and Vive's oldest son, Bob, began experimenting with PTFE by attempting to stretch it up to 50% to fulfill a large order for pipe thread tape. At the time, it was believed that PTFE could only be stretched up to 10%, though. Bob's original stretching techniques were failing, leading to frustration, and eventually Bob yanked the rod of PTFE, resulting in it stretching to a full length of his arm span. The result was an expanded PTFE that retained the original diameter but became soft and pliable. It wasn't until 1976 that expanded PTFE, or EPTFE, entered the market, creating the fabrics we now know as Gore-Tex. 
These fabrics were used in jackets and other textiles to be breathable, waterproof, and windproof. Yeah, my name is James Pollock. I'm an environmental attorney at Martin Law. We're an environmental law firm. We purely focus on environmental issues, and we've been working on PFAS for the last decade or so. It started out mostly in the drinking water context at our firm. My practice focuses, though, on consumer products regulations and compliance for consumer products. So PFAS has started to enter a lot of my work day to day. My clients include a number of large brands in the outdoor industry, apparel manufacturers and retailers, footwear, as well as food products manufacturers and furniture manufacturers are the main categories that my client set fits in. PFAS has been a pretty big part of my work nowadays. <laughs> PFAS has been around since about the 50s, 60s, when it was first developed. It was quickly discovered how useful it could be in a number of different contexts in consumer products as well as industrial processes. It's not hard to think of a use for a chemical that's both water repellent as well as oil repellent. It means you can have the same piece of gear or the same item repel burger grease and rainwater, which is a pretty astounding thing. It became used in nonstick cookware, in raincoats, in medical implants, in any number of different product sets throughout those decades and up till now. With all of the seemingly thousands upon thousands of applications, both in and out of the consumer market, we also need to remember that PFAS isn't just one chemical. It's a class of chemicals, which allows its use to become more expansive and pervasive. Well, the number keeps changing. <laughs> And so I have just taken to saying many thousands. I think it might be 14,000 now. And I don't think anyone knows what's used in consumer goods because unfortunately there's no transparency. That's one of the big problems is it's almost impossible to find out if there are PFAS, let alone which PFAS are in your products. How can that be though? How is it possible that we don't know which PFAS are used and where they are being used? PFAS are an extensively complex class of chemicals that are best explained by a chemist. If I start with what is PFAS? PFAS is a very big group of fluororganic chemicals and polymers. They have one thing in common. They have a fully fluorinated or perfluorinated moieties in the structure, at least one, meaning that at least one carbon is all bonded to fluorine and not hydrogen at least one. And then, of course, there could be more moieties added to the structures. Due to this bond, the fluorine carbon bond, they have what we call extraordinary properties. It could be in a bad and a good sense, extraordinary. The carbon fluorine bond is the strongest we know in organic chemistry. And that's one of the main reasons the PFAS are persistent. And that means that they're a no known degradation products in the environment. They don't mineralize. The terminal degradation products are perfluorinated acids, like PFOA, for instance. And uh, I, this is a big part of the problem. They don't fully degrade under normal environmental conditions. And uh, here we are. So every molecule that was produced the first time in the late 40s are still out there. A PFAS structure a molecule, I explain the polymers in the next sentence, have three parts. The first part is the perfluorinated tail, where you have this, the market talks about C6, C8. In the current world of PFAS, which is, I hope, so nice, you have six perfluorinated, fully ferrinated carbons in the tail. In between, you have a spacer. And the spacer separates the third part, the hydrophilic part, with the perfluorinated tail. Otherwise, the molecule would completely be destroyed. So the spacer is a fingerprint. How and to what family these PFAS belong? I will not go into further details. So you can't really identify the kind of process manufacturing of that particular group of PFAS looking at the spacer. And the hydrophilic part, the arrowhead, we call it, there are various arrowheads that are designed 
for a specific purpose. Now some chemistry. You have sulfonamides, for instance. Those arrowheads that have sulfonamides are pesticides. If you have an acrylic or a urethane head, they are precursors for what we call, for instance, on textiles, the DVR treatments. You have quite a number of arrowheads adopted for their specific purpose. And with a variety of uh, linear and branched and different arrowheads and different spacers, you get quite a number of various PFAS chemicals. This is all the substances, and most of them are surfactants. They have an extremely low surface tension, which are maybe 100 times lower than an ordinary non-PFAS surfactant. So that's why they are used, they're very efficient in certain industrial processes as dispersants, as emulsifiers, etc., etc. And then we have the other big group, the polymeric PFAS. We have the fluoropolymers, for instance, PTFE, that makes the basis and the functionality of these microporous membranes. You have, you have uh, side chain chlorinated polymers that are very different. They are structures that are reacted on, a, for instance, a textile surface, vertical to, and now it sounds, looks religious. No, vertical to the textile surface, and these perfluorinated tails, they stick up from the surface, and they make this oil and water repellent property, among other things. And we have these oils, we have these perfluorinated polyethers, they are actually polymeric. They are oils used in different kind of construction and lubricant applications. They are polymeric, that's on this discussion. And uh, they are well, not really used in textiles, but they are used in uh, machinery and this kind of stuff. So you have a variety of designed PFAS for their very specific purpose. And this makes it so hard to list every specific kind, at least when you have a bit less than 12,000 PFAS with CAS number. You have three or four times more without CAS number. And we think this is just the tip of the iceberg. So me working quite regularly with the, the, is the challenge of PFAS, I've only looked at a small dot in the whole universe of PFAS. And I learn something new every day. From the discovery of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances in 1934, the chemistry has come a long way. And while the innovation of this class of chemicals has been astoundingly effective in applications like firefighting foams, waterproof rain jackets, and Teflon pans, our appetite for convenience created a toxic chemistry we may have to live with forever. In the next episode of Forever Chemicals, we'll dive deeper into how the controversy surrounding PFAS grew into a global health crisis and how it has persisted in manufacturing to this day. If you want to learn more about what PFAS are, where they're found, the proven health effects, how you can limit your exposure, up-to-date news on PFAS, and how to get involved in PFAS regulatory efforts, visit toxicfreefuture.org, foodandwaterwatch.org, or pfoscentral.org. SnapLink Consulting provided expert fact-checking and guidance for the creation of this podcast. SnapLink Consulting provides corporate sustainability strategies and ESG support across a broad range of industries, including apparel, footwear, home furnishings, software, cosmetics, professional services, and more. Head to snaplinkconsulting.com to learn more and contact the experts to guide you through complex topics like CSRD, PFOS, greenhouse gas assessments, SBTI, CDP, Ecovatus, B Corp, and many more compliance and certification frameworks. Forever Chemicals is a Blackfooted Ferret production. All the source material for this episode can be found in the show notes or at theoutdoorminimalist.com forward slash forever chemicals. As an independent podcast, we rely on listener support as our primary avenue for funding. If you like this show and our other content, consider donating to our GoFundMe. The link is in the show notes.